get going. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. White. This is M1105. And I'll be passing around a tendon sheet. I do this every class. I do the lab, too. Now, I'm here, your first name, that's the name given to me by the school. If you'd like to be called something else, cross this off and print your name you'd like to be called. Because by the second test, I will know all your names. Which is quite amazing because I have a very special talent. If you tell me your first name, I'll forget it in 20 seconds. If you tell me immediately afterward, I can forget it even quicker. But by the second test, I will know your names. Which is quite amazing because I have 48 students here. I teach at Elgin Community College. I have another 24. That's a lot of names I have to learn, but I do. And that's because you guys are worth it. All right, I'm going to pass it around. Also, since I printed this out earlier in the week, if there are any late ads, and you're not on here, print your name and sign at the bottom if you're not on the list. And let's get going. A right, couple things. First of all, you'll, this semester you'll learn a lot about me personally. It comes out when I teach. And the first thing you should learn about me, those of you who had lab yesterday or you heard this, is I have my bionic ears on. And because of that, my hearing is not the greatest, even with these. It's hereditary. My grandfather, my mother, my sisters all have that problem. Or my mother and grandfather did. My sisters do. And because of that, if you talk softly, I won't be able to hear you that well. If you talk with an accent, I might have trouble hearing you. If you talk softly with an accent, well, I'm going to have trouble. So please bear with me if I ask you to repeat something once or twice. Because of that, I have a bad habit. I'm not a bad habit, but a habit I've develop while teaching, if somebody asks a question, I'll do this. And all of a sudden, you got this big guy with a beard standing over you, you might feel intimidated. I have never and will never intimidate a student. I'm just getting closer to hear you. And I'll do that without even thinking. But some people, if I don't tell them, I was intimidating that student, or whatever, I tell them. All right. Uh, Another important, probably the most important thing I'll teach you this morning is the following. In my class, in the lab, there's no such thing as a dumb question. In my universe, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I didn't learn that lesson personally until my, I think it was my second or third year in grad school, I got my PhD from Michigan State. I have a PhD in synthetic organic chemistry, and most of my adult life are good part of it. I worked in the industry, but I'll talk about that in other days. But uh, I was giving a talk to our research group, and we had a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Palazin, where he had a PhD in organic chemistry, and he asked a question to me, will you explain something? And afterward, I said, Larry, that's something you ask the question. We teach undergrad organic. You didn't know that? He said, and I asked, weren't you embarrassed asking that question? He said, what? I didn't know it. You answered my question. No, I do. What's wrong with that? And I realized you should never be embarrassed asking a question. And therefore, I came up with the idea there's no such thing as a dumb question in my class, my lab, or anything. All right. A couple important things. One, if you need to, out that door and to your right immediately is the restroom. Anytime you feel like you need to, go ahead. I will. If I have to take a break during lecture, usually I don't, but if you do, just go ahead. Also, uh, since it's near breakfast time, if you want to bring food in the classroom, Feel free to bring anything that's legal in the state of Illinois, city of Elgin, Glen Ellen, wrong city. I get those confused because I teach at both schools, or in the uh, COD. All right, I'm going to do something, and I'll explain later why. Do not write this down. This is a very important number in chemistry. Call Avogadro's number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. 
All right. Uh, another thing, uh, the last time I checked, I don't walk on water unless it's frozen, and even then I stay off it. If I ever make a mistake in the class, let me know, because I'm not perfect. So if I ever do something like this, I hope you always know you made a mistake there. I know it's for. And so let me know. All right, a couple things. If you look around here, we have, hopefully everybody's here today, 48 students. This is called a double section. The way COD saves money is they have two sections. You either registered for 01 or 02, and both sections meet on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here for lecture. Then one group, 01, who was with me yesterday, meets in the lab on Tuesday, and Tomorrow, the O2 section will come to the lab, and that's how I do that. But all of you, we have lecture here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and it's in my syllabus. A couple of things. First of all, how, how many of you are familiar with Blackboard? Okay, so you all are. Anything I put up on this screen is available in Blackboard. It's in oh, once a while, if I say D2L at the other school, called Desire to Learn, that's their equivalent of Blackboard. Blackboard is far superior to D2L. But if you go and log in, this is my login, but you'll be able to see all these different things here, like announcements, and which I hope you all read your email. You should be reading your student email on a regular basis. And course information I'll talk about in syllabus. And this is all available to you on Blackboard. And what I'd like to do is go through the syllabus. And by the way, I should warn you, I have one of the fastest mouse wheel fingers this side of the Mississippi and the other side. And if you ever want me to back up a page, let me know and the answer will always be yes. By the way, Avogadro's number is still 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Oh, it's in blue today. I'm going for the Guinness Book of World Record how many times in the next 25 minutes I can say I'm a number. I'll explain why later. All right, let's go through the syllabus. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of it, but there's some important parts. I've told you my name is still Dr. White. Uh, here are the different sections. We both sections meet here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a lecture. Please be on time. I start on time. And that's the lab section. Years ago, they gave me a phone number, which is really a voicemail box. I can't remember what year I last checked it. I know it's been at least three or four years. Don't bother calling me there. You won't get me. Best way is email, whitek at cod.edu. I check it twice a day, every day. And when I do get up early today, I was checking it this morning about 5.30. And later sometime this afternoon or tonight, I'll check it again. That's the best way. If it's an emergency, call the departmental secretary here. Just ask for the uh, HSC or part-time office, or you can ask for the dean and the dean's secretary, and they can reach me. But that's the best way. And here, there are certain things all faculty are required to put in. I'm going to skip these, like the catalog description, the objectives, topical outline, uh, continuing on, the active course file. Now, the textbook, which I, guess what, I forgot to bring it, is, how should I say this point? Awful. I, was, I didn't take it at full time faculty. Luckily, the way I lecture, and also I'll talk later on, that I created my own problem sets for this course are uh, in Blackboard. You'll find you don't need the textbook. If you want to buy it, go right ahead. I'd highly recommend it. No, it's not that good. In fact, it's pretty poor. But that's something. You decide, but really, if you go, how many of you read about me in ratemyprofessor.com? Wow, 
How many of you heard about me from your friends or neighbors or loved ones? I see one person. Uh, well, you'll find out if that's true this semester. It is. But anyways, uh, you'll see students say, don't buy the book, and there's a reason. The lab book, I'll bring, the, yesterday I had it for the lab, and I'll bring it tomorrow for tomorrow's lab. You do need to buy it. And you can't use a rented one or a borrowed one because you'll have to rip out pages to hand them in. Attendance. Before I talk about attendance, I should teach you something else about me. And that is, I'm a very selfish person in certain ways. Very selfish. And the way I'm very selfish is, I like things happening around me that make me feel good. I don't know about you, but I do. And one of the things that makes me feel real good is at the end of the semester when I see students getting good grades. I'm not one of those faculty members who say, oh, look how hard my class is because 90% flunk. No. I look at the other way. I get happy when I see A's and B's. In fact, one of my best dreams is to have a class where everybody, and listen carefully, earns an A. That's happened twice uh, here when I taught 1211, which is also chemistry, and I had a class like this, and I think I had 46 A's and two B's. And I was upset at first, and I said, oh, I wish those people had gotten an A. And then I realized if I hadn't helped them, they would have probably flunked. So for them to get a B was quite an accomplishment. So, but uh, last semester, and I might be off on the numbers, but I want to say at least 80% of the class earned A's or B's, and the key thing is earned. I did have one person flunk and a couple people that get good grades, but yeah, you have to do the work, and I'll explain some things today, how to, what you can do to get a good grade in my class, because it makes me feel much better to see students succeed than not uh, and fail. And one of the important things to help you succeed is shelf collection. Because of that, I take attendance, and not everything will be in the book, like don't buy the book. And therefore, I have in there, if you miss more than six lectures, I reserve to write. And the key word is reserve to write to give you an F. In other words, show up, you do better by coming to my lectures. Uh, I'll do the attendance that it make, is still making the round. Don't forget, if you want to change your first name, feel free to do that. And anyways, uh, if you come in late after attendance makes its round list, I'll put it here, and before I leave, you sign in. Try to be on time, because you don't want to mix lectures. Uh, all right, now. In here, I have this part about student behavior. And I've only had this problem twice. I've been teaching at COD a number of years now. And I have this here because I had, over the years, only twice serious problems, and students really had serious problems. And I worked with one of the deans to come up with language to protect myself and the students you from that situation. All right, if your behavior is unacceptable, you're really being disruptive, I'll talk to you in private. I'll also send you a letter how to correct your behavior. And I'll send a copy of that to Dean of Students and my Dean, Dean of Math and Science. If your behavior is totally, totally disruptive, I'll ask you to leave. Oh, by the way, if I ever ask you to leave, I'll also not drop you. I'll give you an F at the end of the semester. And if it's totally unacceptable, I'll ask you to leave. And I'll also contact the Deans. I had one student years ago who had serious mental problems. Unfortunately, I'm a chemist, not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And eventually, I had to uh, get help with the dean. And he had problems with that student, too. And we finally got the academic vice president in the problem, too. And that was this unfortunate situation. Other than that, I just want to make you aware of that. I'll talk about cheating. There are two things that get me upset. Students, anybody who lies to me, and students who cheat. And I'll do it to my syllabus, and you should be following the academic, the code of academic conduct about cheating and all that. 
but it's safe. I'll talk more about the lab for those people tomorrow in the lab. Yesterday you heard that already. All right, cell phones. A couple things about cell phones. First of all, you have a cell phone, which I assume just about everybody in here does, turn it to silent mode. Nothing stops electric dead in its tracks than an unusual cell phone uh, ringtone. So please keep it. Now, if you're expecting a phone call and life happens, you might have to get a phone call and take it. Go outside. Take it outside. Just feel free to anytime that happens. Now, the other thing is texting. And a couple years ago, in the faculty email, there was a tremendous debate among the faculty on what to do with the students texting in your class. And there are two groups. One was ask them to leave, tell them to stop. The other group is, well, just ignore it unless they're really disrupting the class. And I stayed out in that uh, debate, but my personal opinion is you're all adults. If you need to text, we'll go ahead, but I'll tell you the following. This has happened numerous times, teaching this course and other courses. <coughs> I'll see a student uh, texting on their cell phone. By the way, I don't lecture like this the whole thing. I look at you, because if I see looks on the people's faces like this, I better explain that again. And I can see students texting. And it's happened more than once. I'll see a student, a lot of all the lecture on their cell phone. They usually get a deer up. And about a semester or two later, they'll take me again. And then they won't be on their cell phone. And they'll get a B or an A. And I'll let you draw what conclusions you can about texting class, but please don't be disruptive. By the way, Avogadro's number is so 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But do not, do not raise your hand. If you are a special needs student, and sometimes called a blue card student, please see me in private. I have for many, every year I've been here, totally supported the, project, uh, the needs of students like that, and also totally support the Center for Access and Accommodations. I'll get an email if you're one of those that deals with testing and other special needs you have. I totally, totally support that. See me in private if you're one of those students. All right, now for the important part. By the way, you might not think this, but a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was a student too. I still remember being a student. So let's talk about the important stuff. And the first thing is, how do you get a good grade in this class? Because I assume all of you would like to get a good grade. And the first thing is, there's going to be four tests. Here are the tentative uh, dates for those tests. Why tentative? Well, like last winter, if we had super cold and they closed down the school and if it was a test day, we're not going to be here, or if a snow day. But generally, I keep to the schedule. But I can change it in case there's things. Now, there'll be a final comprehensive exam. It's stated in the catalog. It'll be on uh, 513. I should change this at the class 9 o'clock. And I'll talk more about that later in the semester. So you're going to have four tests in the final. Later in the semester, I'll be giving an extra credit project. Usually I give one. It's optional. But if you want to get some extra credit points, I recommend you do that. And we'll be having that. Now, I'll talk more about the makeup policy later on in the semester. All right, now, let's look at your grade. You're going to have four hourly exams. I take the three, three highest hourly exams and add them together. Also add to that your final and then your lab. Lab will be worth uh, 13 times 11. I forgot how many points that is, but it's worth 25% of the grade. And you add them all together, some of the three highest test scores your final exam, your lab total, plus your extra credit, multiplied by 100, divided by 532, which is the maximum amount of points that include the extra credit, you'll get a percentage. And if your percentage 
gives 90 or higher, you get an A, A, E, 9, B, uh, C is 70, 79, C, and D, F, and so on. And like I said last semester, last uh, time I taught this, and most classes I teach, I expect A's to be at least above 60% if you do your job and I do mine. Who part of my job is Avogadro's number is still 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But anyways, and that's the grading. Uh, it's nothing uh, subjective. It's straightforward. By the way, uh, generation gap, and once in a while, well, I went undergrad to IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, and when I went to school, where I went, you had a midterm and a final. Depending on the teacher, the midterm was 50%, your final was 50%, or the midterm was 40%, your final was 60%. And midterm and finals times was not a fun time in life, because all only two tests for the whole semester. But luckily things have changed and things are better. Any questions, don't forget in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, in terms of withdrawal, uh, that's totally out of my hands. Uh, the last date is April 10th. By the way, and this is rare, and I'll be honest with you, I rarely have students drop, because I guess I'm doing a good job, or students don't like to drop in my class. And uh, the only time I have students drop is one, because of pregnancy, that's, and the other, either the student or their spouse moves out of an the area. They usually don't, but once in a while I have a student stop coming to class. And if you don't drop, I will issue a grade based on your points. So it's not coming to class, it's not officially dropping. In terms of incomplete, if there's some sort of reason you need an incomplete, you can document it. I'll be more than happy to issue it. I've done a couple over the years. Uh, usually some medical problem or family problem is involved, and life happens. <coughs> By the way, Avogadro's number is still 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. All right, here's the tentative course outline, which I keep to. Here are the various lectures. Uh, today and this week, I'll be going through Chapter 1 and Appendix A2 and A4. Same thing next week, we get into Chapter 2 and so on. And I follow these. Uh, really, you know, if I need to change this a little, I do. If that helps you do better. And that's really the important thing for you to do better. For those taking the lab yesterday, you saw the rest of the syllabus. For those who didn't, I'll have to go over this part tomorrow. Any questions on the syllabus? Let's go to the very end, because there's something I do that we do at Elgin Community College that I do, and not all faculty here do. I know some do who teach over there too. That's called the student agreement. <coughs> and this is an agreement that I'll ask you to sign. also a copy of this on Blackboard. Everybody got a copy? 
If not, I have extra copies up here you can get later on. I do not want this today. Uh, but if I don't have this signed properly with your printer name, signature, date, for lab section, you can either put 001 or 002 or Tuesday or Thursday or T or TH, whichever. Do not hand it in. And what it says is essentially you've read the syllabus thoroughly and you understand it's your responsibility to abide by these policies. And failure to do that will result in funds consequences outright. In other words, what I say in my syllabus, I will do it. You understand, you can, will do it. Do not hand it to me today. All right. Now, an important thing I should mention is the following. If you look behind me, you see I'm taping this. Last semester, and I did this once in the past, but last semester it took me a little while to get the library to agree to give me a camera and try to for the whole semester. I videotaped my whole 1105. I bet you didn't know, I'm a YouTube star. And if you look in syllabus, or not syllabus, in uh, Blackboard, you'll see Dr. White's um, 1105 YouTube. If you click on this and go to videos, You'll see, here I am. And it's, it was a smaller room, so things came. Wow. See, I've already done this the same shirt, even. <laughs> Deja vu all over again. But anyways, uh, if you miss a lecture or something like that, this will be available. Because the first couple of weeks I didn't take video, I'll be doing this. Also, a couple uh, when I started doing this last semester in school and changed the software for video editing. Luckily, I'm a power computer user, so it took me about a week and a half to learn how to do it, maybe about two weeks to learn how to use the new software properly. And I'll be uploading some uh, remastered ones where I learned how, where these are very dark, and if you notice, I learned how to lighten things up. Uh, and it's Adobe software, which was quite complex and took me a while. Uh, the Adobe documentation is awful. But anyways, the software is great. So this is always going to be available to you. And like I said, I even have four subscribers. But feel free to look there anytime. And I have, we'll be making a playlist, I did, and so you'll know which lectures. Each one will go, say, here. You'll see topic, test for review. I do reviews for all the tests. All right, and I thought I'd just point that out, that it's available to you. And I just, yeah, come on. All right, in Blackboard, you'll see three folders under course information. One is lectures, one is practice problems, the recommended problem sets, and the other is recommended problems that he answers. All right, before I do that, Avogadro's number is still 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, I need to ask a couple questions of you before we go on. How many of you are here because you have an undying love for chemistry? Raise your hand. How many of you are here because you're planning on getting a PhD or have no PhD in or chemistry? Raise your hand. How many of you are here because someone said you need to take this chemistry? class for a degree, raise your hand. I already knew that, no, you know that, and I'm not going to try and convince you to become a chemist. But what you will find out in my class is the fact that my world of chemistry is your world of chemistry, and it's all around us. And if you think about it, how many of you like the fact that you're able to breathe air and stay alive right now? I don't know about you, but I do. And what you're breathing is oxygen and nitrogen. That's chemistry. All right. How many of you like that you had a nice breakfast this morning or meal today? The food you eat is chemistry. My clothes, this is chemistry. Everything except the light, and even at certain points, physics and chemistry, when it comes to light, comes close. 
but just about everything in this room is chemistry and deals with chemistry. My water bottle, the water inside here, that's a chemical, that's chemistry. And so if you think about it, oh, by the way, what here I have left in my beer, that's chemistry too. So think about why is it important to take this class? Let's see, the air we breathe is chemicals, chemistry. The water that helps keep us alive is chemistry. By the way, if you use the magic device called a towel to wipe your hands to get them dry, I'll teach you later on this semester, that's chemistry, so is the soap you use to wash your hands. So why is it important for you to learn chemistry? Isn't it obvious? Because you want to get a good grade because somebody told you you have to take this course. And I know that, now you know I, you know that, that I know that. Now, one of the things that people have trouble with is chemistry. By the way, how many of you are sort of nervous or just sure to shake your hand? Hey, nervous or so apprehensive about taking chemistry. And you hear a lot of people say, I don't like chemistry. In fact, my older sister hates chemistry. She had a dad in high school. Luckily, my father helped her through. I was too young to know chemistry at that point. But anyways, they really, you don't really hate chemistry. You hate the person who taught chemistry to you because they didn't do a good job. You know, hopefully I'll do better and you'll find out chemistry is fun. But I'm biased, I'm a chemist. By the way, Avogadro's number is still 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. All right, so the question is, how do you learn to do well in a chemistry class? Well, in order to teach you that, I have to talk about a bicycle. A bicycle? Yeah, a bicycle. Let's assume you don't know how to ride a bicycle. And being the nice person I am, I am, but don't tell me if I don't use word my name here, but I am, I give you the best Blu-ray ever made on how to ride a bicycle. And you've got a big screen TV and a Blu-ray player, and you watch that for next month. You go slow motion, frame by frame, until a month from now you know that video by heart. What's going to happen the first time you get on a bicycle? You're going to fall off. And what happens later on? You practice and you get better. Guess what? Learning chemistry is no different. If you don't practice things, you're going to fall off on the test, which is not a good place to fall off on. But if you practice, you'll get good. And that's one of the reasons my students do good, because I provide a practice problem, we go through them, but I'll be doing problems in the classroom. If you watch me, it's no different than watching the Blu-ray of how to ride a bicycle. Until you try it, try it at home on the practice problems. And if you have problems, come in and ask for help which I provide all students. And then when you take the test, you'll do well, which is a good thing. Uh, at least I think it is. <coughs> now, most of you once in a while do a generation gap. How many of you are familiar with probably one of the greatest sports stars in Chicago land history? By the way, I was born in Chicago and I've lived most of my life here, except when I went to Michigan State. Uh, for my PhD in Michigan. How many of you are familiar with Michael Jordan? Have you heard that name? Michael Jordan, when he was playing in the National Basketball Association, NBA, was the best of the best of the best. He was the very best. And if you lived in Chicago, and this is back in 95, and I'm not going to ask how many people remember 95, don't raise your hand, but back then, You'd see on TV in the sports reports or in the newspaper, you'd see always once in a while the report that Michael Jordan, the best, he was always the first one on the practice court, the last one off. And you wonder why? This guy's the best. Why is he practicing? That kept him the best. And chemistry is no different. You have to practice. By the way, Avogadro's number is still 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, another thing I should tell you about myself, I teach by my gold rule of teaching. And that is, I don't do to my students what I didn't like done to me. Which means, class ends at 10-2, I'm going to end then. Once in a while, I may go 20, 30 seconds later, 
But when I was a student, the teacher keeps on going on and on like the energized. Come on, class is over. Let me get out. So I don't do that. And it's also the way I write my test. My test in here and the final are written that if you've done the practice problems, don't be 50 minute tests or 50 minutes, but if you've done the practice problems, you should be done in about 30, 35 minutes. If you haven't, well, you can do all day, you might have problems. And that's part of practicing. Also, everything on my test, every question, I'll go on over the concept of that question on the test at least twice, usually more. Oh, it's still up here. Alpha Gaudio's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And we'll talk about that. All right, any questions before we get into chemistry? Only once, twice. Well, let's get there. All right. And everything you see on the screen is on Blackboard. And the first question is, what's chemistry? I'll never ask on a test. And I'll let you know, because I don't think anybody in here can read my mind. Hold on. Let's see. Do you think about what I'm thinking about? Anybody think about 222 bicycloctanones? Knowledge do I use for my PhD? He says, see, you can't read my mind. And I know that. I'll help you understand what's important and what's not. Anyways, when we talk about chemistry, uh, chemistry is the study of the composition of structure, properties, and reactions of matter. Another way of saying that is chemistry is a science that tries to understand how matter behaves by studying something called atoms and molecules. I'll never ask the son a test. So you don't have to write this one down, but I will let you know. But now you understand what chemistry is and why we need to understand chemistry and how things work is it allows us to make this water bottle by understanding chemistry. The area I worked in, by the way, I have 10 U.S. patents, chemical patents. One area I worked in is fabric softeners, where I created new molecules for fabric softeners. I don't know about you, but I like my clothes soft and wrinkle-free, and fabric softeners help to do that. I've also worked in other areas of chemistry. All right. When we talk about chemistry, there are four main branches of chemistry. And the first one is the most important, because I'm biased, is organic chemistry. You should know these one, at least one of these four branches. And by the way, while you write it down, Avogadro's number is still 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and it's in blue ink. Now, first one is organic chemistry, and that original, that deals with, and I'll teach some of that in this semester, deals with molecules with carbon, hydrogen, and originally it was molecules that came from things that were alive, organic. But it's been expanded. The next one is inorganic chemistry, which is not one of my favorite. And that's a study of things that were molecules from things that were never alive, like a rock or things in a rock or something like that, where my shirt comes from something cotton that was a plant. And then there's physical chemistry, which deals with certain how atoms and molecules interact. Uh, and part of that is called quantum mechanics, we won't get into in here. And finally, analytical chemistry, which deals with how to measure things. How many of you have seen the CSI programs on TV? And you know where you see those chemists measuring and analyzing things? Those are all analytical chemists. But if I were to ask on the test, name one of the four branches of chemistry, well, I would name organic, because that's the best, but I'm biased because I'm an organic chemist. But any one of those would be acceptable answers. Now, if I say if I 
uh, if I were to ask, name one of those on a test, that means it's a question I can ask on a test. So I'm telling you things you should know. And a lot of times I'll do that. By the way, Avogadro's number is still 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, when we talk about chemicals and chemistry, what is a chemical? And I won't ask this definition on a test, but I'll be using the term, and you should know what these terms mean. That's any matter used or produced uh, by a chemical process. That's sort of our right definition. And a substance, which can also be called a chemical, because you can use both interchangeably, is a chemical that consists of, or a chemical, it's another way of saying, consists of one type of matter that always has the same composition and properties wherever it's found. So if I look in this bottle, I have this mysterious stuff called water, which I think some of you know is H2O. And whether it's here in Glen Ellen, if I go to one of my favorite cities, because I work for two Dutch companies, Amsterdam, if you go there, or if you go to the moon, or if you go to Mars and find water, it's always going to be the same. That's the one of the nice things about chemistry. Now, when we talk about chemistry, it's a study of matter, and the question is, what's matter? And you should know, what is matter? Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. So if you look all around, this tabletop has, it's made up of matter, because it's occupying the space here, and if I were to take it off, I could weigh it. Uh, by the way, so is my shirt, so am I, so are you. We're all made up of matter. And it refers to the mass of something, refers to the amount of matter present. Oh, by the way, how many of you in this room are planning on leaving our planet in the next 18 weeks, like going to Mars, Venus, Jupiter, the moon. Ah, either am I. So some chemists will debate me, but I will use mass and weight interchangeably, even though weight is gravity related. Since you're going to stay on the planet, we could use it interchangeably. So we have mass, matter, which occupies space, something that occupies space and has matter, has mass. And that's matter, and this is about everything except the light that you look around this room where your universe is. All right, Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I don't think I said it enough times, but let's do an experiment. Avogadro's number is, how many people can still see the writing up here, even though I erased it? A number of you. All right, what I've just done is taught you how to memorize things. In this class, you're going to have to memorize things. About a year and a half ago, I came up with a change in philosophy, where I cut way down on the memorization in my chemistry classes, general chemistry, because I'm testing chemistry, not your ability to memorize things. But you still have to. And the best way to memorize something is to write it down and say it five times. And what I just did during this lecture was point to something visual and say it, auditory, a noxious number of times. And because of that, it's burned in your brain. And if I were to ask you next week, remember what color I wrote that in? You probably could remember it was, yep, you're right, blue. And that's a good way of memorizing things. Uh, you'll learn more, I don't get to it today, but on Friday, there's a certain thing you should start memorizing, certain chemical symbols. And by writing down the symbol and saying the name, if you're in the library, say it silently in your brain, because I don't think librarians want you talking too loud. But anyways, you'll do that, and that will help you memorize things. So, that's how, why I did that experiment. Well, by the way, I'm an organic chemist. We do experiments. I have an experiment with you, too. All right. 
listen up before you write anything down, stop. Ooh, it work. During the semester, I'll do the following. Click. The switch, will this be on a test, is in the off position. There's some stuff I'd like to cover, but I'm never going to put it on a test, and I'll never put it on the final. And you people in the front have everybody behind you as witness will say that, and vice versa. So let's talk about the scientific method, which unfortunately in our society right now, certain politicians, that's about all the politics I'll get into, is out of vote in favor. But the scientific method involves making observations. Once you observe something, you come up with a hypothesis, you're somehow interpreting the data, and then you test that hypothesis by doing experiments. And once you find experiments validate that hypothesis, it becomes a theory, or sometimes we'll call that a law. And everything I'll be teaching you, someone did experiments to prove that it's true what I'm telling you. And that's the beauty of science, that's the beauty of chemistry. And I do think it's beautiful. Uh, I like it a lot, but then I'm biased, I'm a chemist. And we'll be doing this. This will never be on test, but this is the background behind everything that we are doing. All right, well, I will get to it today real quick, and I'll come back to this on Friday. Now, one of the things, time for a public service announcement from me, the management. One of the things that will be very important this semester is chemical symbols. I'll never ask you what a chemical symbol is, but let me define it. It's one or two letter symbol abbreviation for name of elements. So we'll learn later on what element is. I'll never ask on a test, but you should know the first letter is always capitalized. There's a second letter, it's lowercase. Now, I'll teach you later on about the periodic table. my favorite one. It's called the dynamic periodic table. And if you notice, up to this one, there are 118 elements here. How many of you have had family or teachers that made you memorize all those? Uh, I'm sure some of you have. That's a waste of time. I work in the real world. I live in the real world. And this is in the real world. A lot of these I've never touched. And I've been doing chemistry a few more weeks than you have, a few more decades. And therefore, it's a waste of time to learn the symbol and the name. Example, I don't know how to pass him. I will never see, you will never see. So I learned it. So in light of that, what I have done is here's this list. And we'll go over it again. These are the only elements that you need to know from the periodic table, because these are things in your daily life. Like C is for carbon. Your skin's made of carbon. So as we close, uh, H, hydrogen, which makes up water, and these others. Uh, going to hybrid, AG, silver, AU, gold. Those are all things in your daily life. The other ones you're not going to experience, so I would say, don't learn. And with that, I'm out of time. I'll see you on Friday. For those who have laboratory, don't forget to wear the proper clothing. Don't forget to shoes and all that. You don't need your lab book tomorrow. With that, oh, by the way, quick thing. On Monday and Wednesdays, I've got to get out of here and get to Elgin. Friday, they'll do some questions.